Welcome everyone, my name is Brendan and I would like to welcome you to New Hope Windward. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are so glad that you're here. In a few moments, we're gonna hear a great message, but before we do, we're gonna worship God through our giving. Because Jesus modeled a heart to serve the broken and hurting, a key mission of New Hope Windward is to share Christ's love with many disadvantaged individuals and families locally and around the world with the hope that they will be reached and transformed by the power of Christ. Through your generosity, we've been able to financially resource 22 ministry partners in areas and places where as a church, we simply would not be able to go or equipped to make a difference. One such ministry is The Shelter, a local ministry right here in Kaneohe that provides transitional housing and key resources to single moms and their children to get back on their feet. Many of these single moms have fallen upon unexpected hard times, leaving them and their kids homeless with nowhere to turn. The shelter gives them a starting chance by providing a safe place to live, as well as the necessary resources to find employment and grow spiritually in Christ until they are eventually able to secure steady work and income and move into their own apartments. In Hebrews 13, 16, it says, and don't forget to do good and to share what you have with others because sacrifices like these are very pleasing to God. Way to go, New Hope Winward. You've played a huge role in continuing to bring about life change and spiritual transformation in the lives of many single moms and kids in need. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see three easy, safe, and secure ways to donate. Or you can scan the QR code. Also, by clicking the button on the upper right-hand corner of your screen, it'll take you to our website where you can give a one-time gift or have it reoccurring. Would you bow your heads with me as I lead us in prayer? Lord Jesus, you always have a huge heart for children and families, and we're grateful for the amazing opportunity we have to partner with the shelter to help support moms and kids in need. You never turned a blind eye to the needs of the hurting, and it's our desire to model after your heart by bringing hope, healing, and restoration to the many single parent families residing at the shelter. Thank you for the many in our church who choose to live for eternal kingdom purposes through their generosity. We honor you through our giving today. In your name we pray, amen. Now, if you're joining us for the first time, we're so excited that you're here for service. We have a special welcome gift for you. It's a New Hope Windward stainless steel tumbler. Simply stop by guest services in the lobby after service to pick one up, or you can text the word NEW to 808-736-3777, and we'll mail you a tumbler as our way of saying, welcome to New Hope. We'd love to stay connected with you this week. The easiest way to do that is by following us on Facebook and Instagram, or simply use the QR code on your screen. You often hear us share about how New Hope Windward financially supports 22 ministries and community organizations throughout the year. We're able to do that as a church only through your incredible generosity toward our Christmas offering. Because of you, broken lives have been healed, the poor and disadvantaged helped, and families restored both locally and around the world. In fact, last year, New Hope Windward, you generously gave a total of $312,461 toward our Christmas offering. That is nothing short of amazing. This year, we have given away to date $320,761 because many of you generously gave above and beyond the Christmas offering last year. Next Sunday, you'll have the opportunity to see how your generosity has made a difference in the lives of thousands of people, as Pastor Dave will share both personal stories and updates on those touched by these ministry partners. You'll also have the opportunity to contribute to this year's Christmas offering. There's no pressure to give to the offering, but we'd like to encourage you to pray this week if the Lord would want you to participate. And this Tuesday, November 29th, is officially designated as Giving Tuesday across the world as a global movement to unleash the power of radical generosity to do good and contribute towards building a better world. If you're planning to give toward the Christmas offering, you're welcome to give on Giving Tuesday by going directly to our website. And speaking of Christmas, can you believe that December is just a few days away? That means our Christmas services are right around the corner. On Saturday, December 17th, and Sunday, December 18th, we have an incredible Christmas program lined up with awesome worship, an inspiring message by Pastor Dave, and a powerful testimony of the life-changing power of Christ.
On Saturday, December 17th, Christmas services will be held at Legacy Church at 6.30 p.m. And on Sunday, December 18th, we'll have services at Regal Cinemas at 7 a.m., 8.30, and 10 a.m. Tickets for Christmas services are available online. Simply go to our website or scan this QR code to reserve tickets for you and your guests. And if you're attending live services at Regal Theatres, we've placed Christmas invite cards on your seats for you to invite many of your unchurched family and friends to join us. What a great opportunity to share the hope of Christ with them this Christmas, so be sure to invite them to join us. And because we anticipate many unchurched newcomers to join us for Christmas services, we do need a lot of help to make sure that all four services are the best experience for them. Would you consider serving just once for a couple of hours at any one of our Christmas services on one of these teams? If you'd like to volunteer, simply scan the QR code and one of our team leaders will be in touch with you. Wouldn't it be awesome to play a part in helping others come to know Jesus this Christmas? Well, that's all the announcements we have for you. Today we have a great message, so would you join me in welcoming Pastor TJ. All right, well, hey, it is great to be with you guys and to have you guys here with us, especially if you're joining for the first time, whether that's online at our campuses or here in the room. Listen, we love it. Uh, when people come just to experience and take a big step just to come into a church. Because uh, I've been there before. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I wasn't somebody that was raised fully in faith. And so we get when you come into a new place like this, it can be scary, you know, because like, what are people going to think? Is something weird going to happen? And so we wanted to make an environment where people could invite anybody and they could figure it out on their own. And so if you're here and you um, are new or you're invited from a friend and family in Thanksgiving, we just want to say we're really glad that you chose to join us. My name's TJ. I'm a part of the teaching team here. And uh, what I wanted to do is to kind of start off today with a little bit of an illustration. Um, but for some of you guys, you're going to be like, oh, I love when you do this. And other you guys are going to be like, yeah. So I'll do it like that. Um, tomorrow is my youngest son's first birthday. So I have a little bit of a proud pop moment. My wife took some of these pictures of this kid, and I just I had to bring him. Check this out. Look at this kid. Isn't he cute? This is just my wife on an iPhone, his little smile on that. He's just like full of joy. And I know he's a handsome kid, right? I know some of you guys right now are thinking like, oh, that kid is good looking. Like, must take after his dad, yeah? That's what you're thinking? <laughs> no, some of you guys are like, thank God he took after his mom. Um, but part of the reason why I bring these is, yes, this kid is cute. But I, every time I speak, sometimes people come up after and they say, I love when you bring pictures of your family. And I know there's others of you that are like, just get on with it already. And so you got two different types of people on that. And part of the reason why I wanted to do this here today is this message today. For some of you guys, this is going to be, man, I have been waiting for something like this. For others of you guys, you're going to feel like, I didn't really need this. But I'll tell you this, if that's you, this message today may not be for you, but I'm almost banking it's for somebody that you know. It's going to be for your auntie, your uncle, for your, your, maybe one of your kids. Uh, maybe it has to do with a coworker or somebody that's a classmate. But I'll tell you this, the, the topic we're going to dive into, I'm excited I get to tackle it, um, but I know it's going to be different than what we normally do here at New Hope Windward. Okay, So what are we talking about? You'll find out. We're in this Doubting God series, but I want to illustrate it and start it out with just a story of a, a testimony I recently heard. Um, I was at a different church, not this one, and uh, I was a guy I knew really well. And he was sharing his story from stage. And what he was talking about, um, it was a powerful thing. God had just healed him. He had this like offbeat heart thing. It was radical. Like God did this crazy testimony. Um, but when he got up there, he started to share it. And part of his story had to do with a doctor. And what he said is like, okay, here like was a man of science, but I'm a man of faith. And this man of science said this, but I'm a man of faith, and I said this. And it almost started creating this dichotomy, this kind of like clash, where you could either be a man of science or a man of faith. And for me, that bothers me. Because the reality is, is I don't think you have to choose. But in culture right now today, there's this big thing of like choice. It's almost like you can either believe in science and truth or you can kind of turn your brain off and be a Christian. And I hate that because the reality is, is that God asks us to actually love him with our minds. Yeah. That when you actually understand what even science points to, it's pretty radical. So today we're going to dive into science, believe it or not. 
And some of you guys are like, oh, I cannot wait for this. And some of you guys are like, I should have slept in and had another Thanksgiving right now. But remember, <laughs> this may not be necessarily your flavor, but I'm telling you, there's some people in your life, and I, I'm wired intellectually. This was my story too. Is it's like when you actually understand some of the deeper stuff in this space, it's crazy how God left his thumbprint everywhere. And so I'm going to dive into some of that. So it's going to feel a little bit different. And that's kind of what we're going to do here today. So the first thing I want to say is, um, you know, like they're meant to kind of like actually be together. It's kind of like, you know, like certain phrases we'll say they kind of stick together, like peanut butter and jelly, right? Like bread and butter or like fish and poi, right? Somebody fish and chips, depending where you're from, right? Kind of going in that. Or like Pastor Dave and sunscreen you see how this works like they're meant to stick together you know bald guys in hats right yeah. except when we're preaching so it's just one of these like patterns i had to throw something in there so don't tell dave i said that about him but the point is is when i say science not a lot of us think faith is a counterpart or, or balance but the truth is is they actually fit together way more than you could ever imagine matter of fact i'll say this is that science and faith they're actually not enemies and what you think is when you look at the world is we have our foremost scientists. We think scientists are actually enemies of faith, but the truth is it's actually split. I'll show you. This guy right here, his name is Francis Collins. He's the former director of the Human Genome Project, which is what mapping DNA and kind of this whole thing. And as he directed this and looked at all the different levels, at the end of the day, what he actually determined is like, oh, there's no way there's not a God. Like you, when you look at science, it's unbelievable how much detail and design goes into the human body, goes into nature and the world around it. And it actually led him to faith. So right here is Jonathan Fang. He's the professor of physics and astronomy, physics and astronomy. And as he dives in and he looks at all the science, it actually doesn't drive him away from God. It actually drove him to God. It blew him away at what God did. This is Rosalind Picard. She's the director of Effective Computing Group at MIT. MIT is one of our most prestigious universities in the entire nation. And we think of these places as enemy of faith, but the truth is not. It's split. Sure, there's some people who look at science that drives them away from God, but there's others that just they cannot get away from the inescapable conclusion. Oh, God, let's be real. Last one, this is Ian Hutchins. He's the professor of nuclear science. And when you think of nuclear science, do you think, oh, yeah, that guy must really love Jesus? Most of us don't, right? But the truth is, is he really does. And he'll tell you, it's not because he turned his brain off. It's because as he looked at the science, he just encountered God. It just blew his mind. Jesus said it like this. He said, someone asked him one time, like, what's the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest commandment and the foremost. Seconds like it, you shall love the labor as yourself. And upon these two things, hang the whole law and the prophets. See, so Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your what? Mind. mind. Can I just speak to some of us here that are Christians, maybe church people? Sometimes we're really good at loving God with all of our heart and all of our soul, but sometimes we don't really love him with all of our mind. We don't search out some of these things and we say, I'm just, I'm just going to like, just trust God in that. And that is a beautiful thing. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but we're called to love him with our whole being. And if you're here and you're like me, again, some of you guys, this is going to be a fit, some not. Sometimes when you read the word, you have thoughts that are going in your brain, questions that you're asking. And sometimes you don't say them out loud, but what you're gonna find if you actually ask these questions and search them out, you'll be shocked at how much that God just shows himself true, even when you see itself dug into even science. And so when you even look, it's like the world itself, it actually points towards a designer. Uh, let's say it like this. Um, they have, it, it's called basically, there's like 150 astronomical constants. And some of you guys are like, that sounds boring as all else. But this is basically what it's saying. When you look at the world's design, it's like if even just something just so small was different, everything would change. So for instance, the Earth spins at an axis. You guys know this. And if it was to spin just a little bit more this way or a little bit more this way, do you know what would happen? We'd all die. Literally, we would all die. If the Earth was just three-tenths of a percent closer to the sun, you know what happened? We die. 
See the pattern here? If the Earth spins 10% faster, the Earth would flood and we die. In other words, you start looking through all this. It's like literally if, if it wasn't for how perfect everything fits together and how everything stitched, life could not exist. There's uh, one guy, uh, his name was um, Sir Roger Penrose. He's an atheist scientist. And he was just trying to calculate what are the odds of this all coming together like this? And this is what he came up with. Mathematically, the odds are 10 billion to the 123rd power. And some of you guys that are mathematics or mathematicians are like, oh, that is crazy. And everyone else is like, I have no idea what you just said and I'm not <laughs> impressed, right? So let me kind of illustrate it like this. The same odds, the same odds, if this is true, that everything just happened to come together would be like this. You have the same probability of winning the lottery 10,000 times in a row. And, and every time you go cash in that lottery ticket, you get hit by lightning. <laughs> That's the mathematical probability of the world being like it is. Matter of fact, if you've ever heard of this um, atheist professor named Christopher Hitchens, you guys ever heard of him? He, he passed away, sadly. But he said that when he looked at this evidence, that this is by far the most compelling argument for God, for a creator. So you think, oh, can we believe, believe in the Big Bang and the Bible at the same time? But listen, you understand what the Big Bang theory is actually saying. When scientists study this, what they realize is that they look at the universe, it's expanding, and it, they rewind the tape, and it seems that at some point, the universe just boom, bang, came into existence. And you know what the scripture teaches? That God created the universe like that. You see what I'm saying? Yep. There's this war that's not actually a war. Yep. And it comes into the space. And, and for me, listen, when I, I'm a, a Christian, when I start to see some of this stuff, oh, it builds my faith. It's like, whoa, this is legit. And it's, God's literally stamped his fingerprint. It says this in scripture. I'm just, I'm using science today, but look what scripture said. Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature, they've been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. Acts 17 so it says that men might be able to reach out to him because he's not far. Basically saying this, like God just stamped his thumbprint on creation that when you look at it, it actually points to him. When you see the world, scripture has been teaching this, and guess what science just keeps doing? Just backing it up over and over and over again. Let me just show you one other area. Sorry, I just, I love this stuff, I can't help it. Archaeology, it actually reinforces the Bible. So if you're like me, and not all of you are, but some, sometimes when you read the Bible, in my brain, I start asking myself, especially early on, like, you read some of these wild stories in the Old Testament. I'm like, did that really happen? Anybody else ever think like that? Like, did that really happen? Like, I'll show you an example. This is from Isaiah. It's the story of Hezekiah. Hezekiah um, was basically the king of, of Judah, and they were now surrounded by this big army, the Assyrians. Uh, the Assyrians were basically, um, let, let's say it like this. Um, I'm going to use a fictitious country. Uh, we use an old country, Prussia. Prussia doesn't exist anymore, so I'm not going to say anything about a nation. But let's say that Prussia came and they came after Hawaii. Basically what happened with um, the, the Israelites back in that day is there was uh, 12 tribes and 10 tribes broke away. And so you had 10 tribes of Israel and then two tribes of Judah. Assyria came in and actually wiped out the 10 tribes and took them everywhere. So back to my analogy, if Prussia, this country, came for Hawaii, let's say it took all the other islands except for Oahu. Then on Oahu, it got surrounded by this incredible like ships and navies and like air force, all sorts of stuff, and it's about to attack Oahu. And it's like they've already wiped out all the other islands. This makes sense that they're just going to wipe this one out as well. So Hezekiah is king at this point. And what he does is he runs to God and says, God, what are we going to do? He goes to Isaiah. Can you pray? Isaiah is a prophet at this point. And Isaiah gets this word. It says, this is what the Lord says about the king of Assyria. He will not come into the city, nor will he shoot an arrow there. And he will not come before me with the shield, nor heap up any assault ramp against it. By the way that he came, by the same way he will return. And he will not come to the city, declares the Lord, for I will protect the city to save it for my own sake. And then it says, the angel of the Lord went out that very night and struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when the rest got up early in the morning, behold, 
all the 185,000 were dead. So Sennacherib, which is the king of Assyria, he departed and he returned home the same way and he lived in Nineveh. Now, those of us that believe this word and that's like, cool, we get it. That's what happened. But for some of us that when our brains, it's like, did that really happen? Like literally in one night, you have this entire army surrounding the city. And then one night without anybody fighting a battle, they really left? They really got slaughtered on that? How do we know if that's real? Okay. Now check this out. This is what gets wild. This is where archaeology kicks in. This is called the, the Taylor Prism. They found this in 1830. Um, it's now, if you go to England, you can actually go see it yourself. So I haven't got to see this, but I've seen other artifacts like this. Because for me, I just I had to know. I had to see this stuff for real. This is basically the story of the Assyrians from the Assyrians. So not from the Jewish people, not from anybody in the Bible, that, but this is from Sennacherib and his people. And it basically chronologically points at this point where, hey, guess what? Around this time, I conquered all these other little cities, kind of like the other islands, and then I finally came to Hezekiah. And Hezekiah, I surrounded him and he was shut up, basically validating to a T what scripture paints. Okay, so it's like, oh, wow, now you're not just trusting one person's voice. Somebody over here is actually saying the same thing happened. And get this, okay, back to my analogy. You have Prussia and Oahu. Imagine if um, Italy, who has no dog in this fight, Prussia and Oahu on that. Imagine if the Italians then, they decide to write a story about what happened, how they conquered the islands, and then they all of a sudden vanished and left Oahu. That actually happened in this story here. This right here is uh, Herodias. Herodias is a Greek historian, get this, from the 4th century BCE, 400 years before Jesus. He writes this down, okay? And what he writes, he's not Christian, he's not Jewish, he has no reason to write about it. Just like Italy has no reason to write about Oahu, right? You see what I'm saying? This is what he says, check this out, crazy. He's talking about Sennacherib, and this is what he said happened to his army, the army of 185,000. He said, the enemies came there too, and during the night, one night, they were overrun by a horde of field mice that gnawed quivers and bows in the handles of shields, with the result that many were killed and fleeing unarmed the next day. And to this day, there's a stone statue in Egypt of a king standing in the temple with a mouse in his hand and an inscription to the effect, look at me and believe. Is that crazy? This guy is basically like Italy saying, you'll never believe Oahu was completely surrounded. And then one night, all of a sudden, they, they crashed into these rocks or something happened. And so it's not contradicting scripture, it's actually validating it. Saying in the night, it paints a little bit picture. It's like, okay, maybe the might, like it literally says that God caused some of his creation to overrun this army and an entire army fled. It's just wild to me. You're dealing now multiple sources, but you see what I'm saying? Is it's like, it's still an amazing story. I mean, I don't know about you, but if I had a bunch of mice coming at me, I'd run too. Mice are gross. Like anybody ever had a mice in their house? Just nasty, disease ridden, all that kind of stuff. But nonetheless, if, I'm just trying to point out, you're not just trusting in one thing. It's like time and time, every time we dig in the earth, every time we look for history, it actually doesn't contradict scripture. It actually backs it up over and over and over. So you're dealing with real people. Real things, real things pointing to this. And again, I, I'm speaking for some of you guys. You're like, oh, I already believe scripture. I'm like, great, I'm happy for you. But there's some of you guys in your mind, there's just something stuck. Or for some of you guys, it's you have a kid that they're asking a ton of questions and you don't know how to handle it. I want to equip you to be able to do that, to be able to point some of this stuff because it's like our faith is a lot more rational than anybody realizes. It's just crazy. But the thing that ultimately it comes down to for us is it's not just archaeology that, but really for us, it has to do with Jesus. If you're new here, we don't just teach life skills here, how to be moral and everything else. It actually comes down to Jesus. And the reality is, is everybody believes Jesus actually existed. There's nobody that argues that's in academia that, that's respected. Nobody says, hey, you know what? Jesus wasn't even real. It's just made up. It's like when you look and you see the evidence, it's, it's wild. Now, some people believe he's just a teacher, but there's no way he's just a teacher. And I'll, I'll just give you one last thing, and this is personally why I love it. Um, why I actually trust scripture, too, is uh, it, it paints the full picture. Like, let's take Instagram, social media. 
Some of us are on it, some of us aren't. I've seen some of your social medias. I've seen some of your Instagrams, right? And the truth is, is whenever we post or share something, we pretty much always put our best foot forward. Is that not true? Like some of you guys have figured out, I have a good side and a not so good side. And so like when the camera comes out, you like spin around and go to the other side, right? Just to make sure like it's captured properly, right? Like I want people to see the best. Here's my family, here's our trip. Like if you have kids, it's funny when you see people post vacations of their kids. Everyone's laughing and they're having so much fun. But when you really have kids and you go on vacation, it's like everyone's so stressed. Like at the end of the day, it's like, I paid to take care of my kids in another place. This is crazy, you know, like absolutely. But the picture doesn't show that. When you read scripture, they don't put their best foot forward. Oh man, some of the stuff that they did, it's like shameful. If I wrote this stuff and that, I would probably leave this out. I'll give you an example. This is Jesus on the night that he's betrayed, the night that he's surrounded and be arrested, he's about to be crucified. A crowd comes to arrest him and he says to them, have you not come to me with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would against a man inciting a revolt? Every day I was with you in the temple grounds teaching and you did not arrest me. But this has taken place so that the scriptures will be fulfilled. And it says, and his disciples all left him and fled. Jesus' lowest point in his life, the point when he needed his guys the most, they all bail. Now, they're the ones that are telling the story. I don't know about you, but the thing, I'm not from Hawaii, but I've been here for 20 years. And one of the things I love about Hawaii is just relationship, loyalty, commitment to one another. And like, oh, if you bailed on your friend when they needed you the most, that's like shame. You know what I mean? If I was writing it, I'd leave it out. They put it fully in there. Matter of fact, not only this, but after Jesus dies, these guys all go and hide. These are his top 11. Judas is out at this point. He's his top 11. The ones that are like, ride or dies, I'm here for life. They go and they cower. They're afraid. And it makes sense because to be honest, I'd be tempted to do the exact same thing. But here's what's wild. Between this moment and the end of the disciples' lives, there's a radical transformation. Watch this. This right here is a list, and you can see this. Some of you can Google this if you need to find it somewhere else. But it's all the disciples right here, and what it shows you is the way that they died. See, Peter, he was actually crucified upside down. The same guy who denied Jesus and ran and hid, actually at the end of his life, he gets crucified too for Jesus. Andrew dies on an X-shaped cross. Thomas is impaled with a spear. Philip was either crucified or hanged. Matthew possibly is killed by the sword. Bartholomew, which is Nathaniel, he was either crucified or flayed. They're not sure, but he definitely died gruesomely. James the Greater was beheaded with a sword. Simon the Zealot crucified or sawed or axed to death. Matthias was stoned and beheaded. James the Lesser saw into two pieces. Thaddeus was either clubbed to death or killed. John was um, exiled. They say that it's possibly that he had been boiled in oil at some point, tried to kill him, was unsuccessful. My point is this. You have 11 guys who go and hide, which makes sense. And then all 11 at the end of their lives, they're willing to die. Why? Like, what changed them that they're willing to do this? And what I'm going to suggest to you is this is one of the biggest proofs to me that Jesus had to have rose from the dead. He had to. They must have seen the risen Jesus because why else would you lay down your life and get brutal, brutally tortured? Why else would you let that happen to yourself? I mean, sure, maybe one or two are like, yeah, I'm going to stick with Jesus and he died that way. I'm going to die too. But all 11, all 11 are going to get brutally murdered and tortured for a guy that was just some moral teacher? I don't think so. Something happened and changed them. And what happens when you look at history and society is like, because this catches people eye. People actually have looked at this like, what actually happened to them? How did that work? I mean, look at some of the pictures of this. That, that's not Jesus. This is one of the ones his disciples. It's brutal. There's this guy, his name is Sir Lionel Lucky, who he was a, a British defense lawyer. Uh, this guy is amazing. He had 245 successful cases that he won in a row, never lost. He's like, it's like you pick, he kind of looks like a mafia lawyer to me, but like, you know, sits at the table and like the prosecutor comes, well, how about this? I'll prove it to you. And he's like, nope, boom, 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 win. You know, next guy, I've got all this evidence. Nope, boom, 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 boom. 245 times in a row this guy won. 
So he decided, you know what? I'm going to take on the claims of Christians. I'm going to see if Jesus is who he actually says he is. The master at blowing holes in cases. And at the end of the day, he was so overwhelmed by the evidence that he gave his life to the Lord. How crazy? I just want you to see rational people using their minds. It's wild to come to find out. The facts are a lot more in line with scripture and who Jesus says he is than it ever depicts. Do not let culture tell you that you have to choose between science and God. Do not. God created science. We're just discovering all the things he created. This design and how things worked. And it actually can bolster our faith. You know, I just give a couple further resources for people because I'm going to wrap this spot off. Again, the heart of this message today is for some of you guys, you've been asking and we wanted to answer. For others of you, we just wanted to equip you for when you do have questions, what do you do? Or we record all this stuff, we put it on YouTube. You can send it to friends and family. And if you are friends and family watching this right now, can I just tell you, like, again, we're not trying to force anything. We're just trying to create an environment where you can figure this out for yourself. That's what we're really after on this. But for the resources, you can look at this thing. It's called the Veritas Forum. It's a YouTube channel. This is what it looks like. But they're going to have our best scientists answer questions and back it up. They're going to talk about like physics and astronomic, and you start filling in all these long, big words you have no idea. These guys do, and they'll talk through this stuff. And part of the reason why, Joe, <laughs> my wife was here last service, and uh, it's kind of funny because we'll get in conversations. And I'll be like, babe, did you know? And I'll tell her some sort of a fact. Do you know the first thing my wife does when I tell her a fact? She takes her phone out and she Googles it because she doesn't trust me. She's like, I just, I, I'm not that I don't trust you, babe, but I, I got to know for myself. And I'm like, I respect her for it, right? But here's the thing. Sometimes right now when we're Googling things, especially when it comes to faith, there's some pretty whack stuff out there. Anybody can publish anything. They can put it on YouTube. And so for me, it's like I watch stuff and like guys that are like, like sometimes I'm not thinking of anybody in particular in my brain, but like even preachers, like you hear them preach and it's like you're twisting the word. Augustine actually said it like this. If there's ever a conflict between science and faith, it's either from a misunderstanding of science or a misinterpretation of the Bible. Not crazy? People misinterpret and misconstrue all sorts of stuff. So I just wanted to give you one space where there's a ton of legit people. You can trust these guys. This is a space you can do that. The other one is for those of you guys that aren't Christians that are wanting to explore this and you're intellectually wired. I just want to suggest a book for you to read. It's Mere Christianity. It's by C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis was an Oxford scholar, atheist, full-blown atheist. And he, he basically outlines his journey of just how he kind of got into this and painted it in a clear way. And it's been one of the most like, mind-blowing experiences for the people that are intellectually wired. And so it's a great book to read just to explore again. Not to try to convince you that's not going to be his case. He's just going to lay things out so you can make a, a choice for yourself. But the heart of this, guys, is that just we want you to realize like our faith is way more rational than you'd ever realize. But the truth is, is if you're really going to choose to follow Jesus, it's going to take faith and facts. It's going to take a point where you are going to have to take a step of faith and to be able to trust him. See, the facts, things I'm trying to point out is it's reasonable that God exists, that there is a creator, but you've got to figure that out for yourself. How do you do that? Well, maybe for you, what it looks like is you actually start to pray. It's like, well, I don't know if I believe in God. Great. That's fine. But if he's real, what's the harm in trying to actually pray? I mean, what's the worst that's going to happen? You pray in the room by yourself and nothing happens. You don't even have to tell anybody. But what if you do pray and he answers? This is a fresh story about like a month ago. There's a a person we're connected to in the Ivy League school, full-blown atheist, doesn't believe in God, but was experiencing radical anxiety. And they found themselves praying to a God they didn't believe in. And another friend of mine asked him, why are you doing that? And he says, I have no idea why, but every time I pray, that anxiety goes away. Mm-hmm. They recently just gave their life to the Lord like three weeks ago. Yeah. It's just wild. Why? Because they had an encounter with the living God. Yeah. I mean, the Bible talks about a being. It's meant to point to something. And it either exists or it doesn't. It's kind of like gravity. I could talk to you about gravity all day long, but the truth is if it is gravity, I drop the book and it goes. Does that make sense? You see it in the real world. And what you're going to find is that as we read and as we go through this is that, man, God shows himself all over the place. He wants to be known in this. And those of you guys here that are Christians, you've seen him show up in your life over and over and over again. 
And what I felt like for some of you guys to kind of shift a little bit now, some of you guys are meant to continue to live a life of faith. And at one point you were doing it, but for something happened along the way where you now kind of shrink back and it's got to be just facts. And what I mean is it's kind of like this. So there's a time where we've seen God show up so many times in our life and it's like, oh wow, you're so real. And then we just keep trusting him. But at a certain point we start to shift and then what we start to say is, God, I need you to show me the plan. And if you show me the plan, then I'm going to trust you and take a step. But faith doesn't always work like that. Matter of fact, if you look at Hebrews, it says this, faith is the certainty of things hoped for and a proof of things not seen. For by it, people of old gained approval, but by faith understood that the world has been created, which we talked about by the word of God, so that what is seen has been not made out of things that are visible. And so what starts to happen is you see God show up. Oh my gosh, you might be really right that. And so because of what you've seen, now you're able to move forward. And when he tells you to do something, it's not that I have to have the plan. It's I know who you are. I know what you've done. So when you tell me something, I'm going to now be able to trust you. I'm going to live by faith. I'm going to be the one to put my faith in you, to trust you that you are who you are. Um, I was thinking about my own history. Um, even like right now, like we're in a little bit of like um, some like financial pinch stuff is going on. And when I look back at my history on that, I've had some crazy stories. Some of you guys know this, but my oldest son was in the hospital for 81 days. Gave us this massive hospital bill we couldn't afford. Someone on the East Coast did not know we couldn't afford it, did not know anything. And they felt led by God to write a check to the penny on how much it was going to cost and it showed up in the mail. Holy cow, God, you did this for us. You provided. We were able to get a little townhouse when we couldn't any other time and like that. It's like there's all these things behind, and so now when I face financial uncertainty, for my wife and I, it's become easy just to even like continue to tithe or to be generous. Why? Because, God, we're going to trust you because we've seen you show up all this. Yeah. Well, how is he going to provide for you right now? I don't know, but I know who he is, and I know he provides. Yeah. I know he takes care of me. I know he watches out for me and my family. I could tell you a hundred things on it. So I'm able now to not just live from, like to use the facts to fuel my faith. Does that make sense? And not to say I need a plan for everything else. I have times where God has sent the right person in my life at the right moment to say the right thing. Just blows my mind. I don't have time to tell you the details of these stories, but it's mind blowing. So then when I'm faced with a situation, I have no idea which way I'm supposed to go, what decision I'm supposed to make. I know that he guides me, that he will send people to direct me. And I don't have to be afraid of what I'm going to do. I just have to be willing to trust him and that he will lead me and guide. You see how this works? Yeah. To live a life of faith. It's never going to be I have everything figured out everywhere and I'm going to just now follow a plan because I have 100% understanding. And there's some of us here, that that's what we're actually looking for. God's going to prove who he is to you. And then you're going to have to put your faith in him as he leads you. And he's not going to give you the plan every time, but he's going to come through every time. It may not look the way that you think it would look. It may not do that, but it's amazing to see how true. He loves when people draw near to him. He says every time we draw near to him, he'll draw near to us. And I want to close just actually by talking about, um, this might seem like a little pivot, but to me they're connected. Uh, you saw earlier, we're doing our Christmas offering. And for me, the reason why I wanted to connect this is what I was just talking about, like creating space for people to discover God, that's what we do here. That's been the DNA in this church and the windward side and all over the world for a long time. We don't want to create a space for people to actually encounter the living God and to be able to make a decision for themselves. And what we do is we brainstorm as many ways to be creative and to make this happen. And so like every year we do Christmas offering, which next week is the Christmas offering service. It's my favorite service of the year. It's not Christmas. It's not Easter. It's Christmas offering. And if you've been at Windward, you know why. They bring a ton of videos from these things about what God's done. A ton of things of like the places that we've partnered. Like right now in this church, we're partnered with organizations that are ending sex trafficking on our island. Pastor Dave will go and meet. You'll see the girls talk their stories, go through looking on the back end of everything. It's crazy. We're involved in stuff that's ending people that are homeless and hungry. You've seen that. Even locally here in Kanye, they're not just windward, it's different organizations. See, this church, we don't care to put our name in lights. Like our goal is not to like look at the Koalows one day and it says, New Hope Windward. Like that's not what we're after at all. We're after Jesus and his kingdom and creating a space to be able to do that. So even like this year, just to point some of this stuff out. This year, we're going to actually build a new church. There's a, a church thing that's going on in Cambodia, 
and we're going to build a church for them in that. Awesome, like a brand new space for them. Now, some of you guys are like, where's Cambodia? So Cambodia is over here, Vietnam, Philippines, you put a map, you're welcome, because some of us know that. But that's all the way in the world in that. And what I love about Pastor Dave, he'll actually go like fly to these places. And he goes as kind of like an undercover detective. Like he was telling me like, he went to visit one of the projects in the Philippines and uh, he like raided their file cabinets. Like they, they knew he was going to do this, but he just like, they put him in a room, he looked through whatever he wanted because he wanted to make sure, is this actually legit? Like, is it, are you guys actually doing something? Is this not just like a money grab to be perfectly blunt on it? And every single thing that we've vetted and we've partnered with over the last years, it's, it's legit. Like there's 22 organizations that we're partnering with to see his kingdom come, to create spaces for people to figure out God for themselves. And so what we do as a church is once a year, we all just gather as family and we just pray, God, what do you want us to do to sow into this? What do you want to do to give? Like my wife and I will have this conversation tonight. We'll pray and be like, okay, God, what do you want us to give extra? What does it look like to put faith and to trust you, to partner with you? And to say, I want to sow into this. And then we were able to give. And just to make sure it's really, really clear, 100% of what we give doesn't go, it goes through New Hope Windward, not to New Hope Windward. Does that make sense? Like we gave away $300,000. Like that was last year. When Dave called me after it, we were like almost in tears. Because it's like, we're doing it, guys. We're being a legitimate church that wants to be a blessing to our community locally and all that. And we're not doing it to put our names. The only name we're trying to elevate is the name of Jesus and to give people a chance to figure out who he is and then choose for yourself. And that's the heart of this whole message and everything that we're doing. When you discover how good God is and what he has for your life, it's just, I literally can't think like, I can't even imagine what my life would be like without it. And it's not because, oh man, my life has been perfect. I've had some really, really rough, rough years, especially in the last five. And as rough as it was, man, God just, he was so good to get me through it the way that he has. And I just, I don't know what I would do without him. I mean, understand how I navigated before that. But for me, I had to have a space to figure that out for myself. And you know what? So does your friends. So does your coworkers. So does some of you here. The people you work with, your classmates, the people online, people that are WCCC or, or Swaro, where guys are at. I feel like God might even have you in that space just for him to get to know you, or you rather to get to know him. And that's what we're going to continue to be about as a church. So what I want you guys to do as a partner with us, just to be willing to pray as we go to the Christmas offering on that. But that's the whole heart of this series is doubting God's. Our doubts aren't necessarily a bad thing. Handled properly, they lead to a stronger faith. And when we partner with him in faith, it's wild what God will do. Will you bow your heads with me as we close in prayer? So Father, I thank you for who you are. God, I thank you that your heart is to, to get to know each and every one of us. Thank you, God, that you created us with emotions and with a mind and that we're meant to encounter you in all aspects of our being. And I just pray for my friends. I pray for the ones that have had questions. Thank you, God, that you're not scared of questions, that you're not against questions, that you don't want people to turn their minds off. You actually want them to use them and that you will meet them in the middle of that. And so as they search, God, would you encounter them? I also want to pray, I just feel something strong on family today. Some of us here have family members that are struggling in their faith or young ones that are rising up and asking a lot of questions and we, we don't know what to do or how to handle it. And God, I just pray that you would meet those family members in Jesus' name. That you would help us to say the right thing and to know that all we're meant to do is to point towards you. We don't have to fight them for you. But Lord, I pray that in the journey that you equip us to say the right thing and to share the right story in that moment. And our heart, God, is that just people would encounter you. You're so good. Thank you for the way that you loved us and what you've done in our life. We choose to remember today and to choose again to be a people of faith, knowing that all the facts and all the science and everything else, you've put your thumbprint there to reveal who you are. And we've seen you and we trust you. So when you tell us to step, we're going to step. And as a church, as we step forward in the Christmas offering, we do so knowing, God, that you want to use us to change these islands and change things going on in the world, not for our glory, but for yours. We love you. We praise you. And all God's people said? Amen. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, thank you guys for joining us. That is it for today. Uh, we will see you guys next week. By the way, on your seat, you got those Christmas invitations. Those are to give the people to invite. We've got a crazy testimony on Christmas weekend. You won't want to miss it. But other than that, have a great weekend, everybody. Hey, thank you for watching today. I want to invite you to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream. I encourage you to share this video with a friend. And if you're blessed by this message, you can support God's work by clicking the Give button on the right or on our New Hope Windward website. Don't forget, you can join us live every Sunday online or at one of our New Hope Windward locations. And once again, thank you so much for watching. May God bless you.